Hi, I'm Amy Lewis. Welcome to Universe. We're gonna be talking today about an engineer's guide to starting your own company. I'm here with Danny Grant. Danny, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Danny. I'm the CEO of Jam. We help 150,000 engineers fix bugs faster. That sounds amazing. I can't wait to dig in. So what led you to found Jam? What was the inspiration? My co-founder and I used to be product managers together at Cloudflare. We were the two product managers with a team of 30 engineers, and our job was to ship the risky new businesses for the company. So we had to move really fast because we're taking risks. You can't spend forever to see if something will work. Things had to work great out of the gate. And we just found how much time and frustration was spent going back and forth with engineers about bugs and fixes. What we would do is we would find the engineer in the office. We'd literally hand them our laptops. We'd be like, it's in a perfect debugging state. Here you go. Like, stop whatever you're doing now and debug it right now because we've got it. And we just couldn't believe that there was no way to just share, like, let me show you what needs to be fixed. And that is now Jam. So you record a video of your screen, and it records not just what happened on the screen, but everything in DevTools behind the scenes. And so the engineer gets a link with exactly what to fix. They don't have to wonder how to repro the bug. The repro is right there. That's amazing. So when you talk to people, I'm sure you're explaining to a lot of people how you made this leap. And with a complicated market that we've got, I know a lot of the folks that are watching are gonna be interested in taking their own idea, their own aha moment, and turning it into a company. What's some of the advice that you would give them? First, do it. <laughs> Here are my two favorite frameworks for validating a startup idea. The first is Seth Godin's Rule of 10. You want to you want to build a startup in as easy mode as possible. And so one way to do that is to build startup ideas that naturally spread. So his rule of 10 says, tell 10 people what you're building. If one of them goes and tells another person, your startup will grow organically. Great startup to build. My second favorite framework is from a book called The Mom Test. Okay, think about how many different tools you've heard about in the last month. How many of them have you actually tried? It's probably zero. Like the bar is so high to actually go and sign up for a new product. It actually has to be something that you really care about improving in your life for you to go out and make your life a little bit more complicated by trying something new. And so when you interview prospective users, rather than asking them about what you're thinking about building, you just ask them, what are your top three priorities right now? And in your performance review, what are you gonna be graded on? And if you don't hear the problem that you want to solve with your startup in those things, they probably are not going to go out of their way to sign up and try your product. I love that. So kind of ask the right questions, get the right feedback loop, and then work from there. Let's talk about another, maybe it's a barrier for a lot of folks in terms of getting started. I, I want to think of it as its own language, the, the ultimate speaking to venture capitalist. I think of it as just speaking VC, because I feel like it can be a foreign tongue for somebody who doesn't come from that world. What would be your guidance and advice for someone how to speak to the VCs and how to speak VC fluently? I used to be a VC and I've seen hundreds of early stage founders pitch. And the best founders at pitching, they just deliver a great meeting that the VC wants to do again and again. Because what really is that first initial pitch meeting? It's kind of like a job interview. It's saying, do we want to work on this idea together for 10 to 15 years? And so actually the most important thing is that the answer to that is yes. And let me also see if that would be a good business. Here's one way to think about it. So imagine that I gave you $100,000 to go invest in a couple of early stage startups. So you would go and you'd go meet with a bunch of founders and you'd say like, well, what are you building? And then you would have to choose who to give that money to. And if you imagine, what would you want to hear from that founder for you to be like, hell yes, let's, let's give them a check. It's probably that they're really passionate about the idea. They probably have some credibility behind them like maybe they've spent 10 years in the healthcare space and now they're building the product they wish they could have had. Or maybe they've already gone and done a bunch of research and they're clearly obsessed. Like there's, there's sort of something with gravity. And probably you wanna hear some humility. You don't want someone that's sort of trying to BS their way through all the answers. You want someone who's gonna be thoughtful along the way and says like, yeah, that's a big risk in our business. I'm thinking about it in a few ways. Or yes, there are competitors, but to me that's the signal of how exciting of an opportunity this is. Here's how we're approaching it differently, right? So I, I think when you imagine what would you want to hear, suddenly it becomes a lot easier to imagine how, how to be when you go and pitch. Oh, I love that. 
Okay, one more piece of advice. A lot of founders get discouraged if they don't have an existing network. How do they even reach out to VCs? But when I was a VC, I read every single cold email and cold DM I received because I didn't get that many. And so what that means is that founders, even without an existing network, still have an opportunity to reach out and stand out. But there's a way to do it. The best piece of advice I've heard about this is from one of our investors, Anne Duane at Village Global. She says, don't think selling, think be compelling. Don't sell your whole startup, your whole pitch in that first outreach, just compel a meeting. So what does that look like? If you, if you imagine um, just like going through your email and getting an email from someone you don't know, what would compel you to even respond? Probably it didn't feel like homework to read. There wasn't just like a lot thrown at you. Probably it felt very relevant. Probably it had some energy and probably had some like real gravity. It felt like there's a reason why this is interesting. So what does that look like? Maybe it's something like three sentences. Just listen to you on this podcast. The way you think about this is so interesting. I'm about to quit my job in this space and start this company. Let me know if I can pick your brain. I'm super curious to hear about go to market for this space, whatever, right? It's going to get a low response rate, but I think it has a higher chance of getting a response rate than something super, super long or just not reaching out at all. That's such great advice. I'm also thinking we've spoken so much about the ways to decide if something fits into the framework, if something is a good idea. What advice do you have for folks to get over that fear of failure, if you will? How do you let go of an idea that maybe isn't working? How do you move past and keep on moving quickly? In the early days of Jam, I felt really nervous about pivoting because, oh, we've worked so hard on this one version of the product. Like, what is the months of work going to go away? But I'll tell you that it actually gets more painful the longer you wait to pivot. And so you kind of have to rip the Band-Aid because it feels so good to work on a thing that's working and providing value that people use every day and love. Maybe it's a reframe. Maybe it's not the fear of failing, but maybe it's, it's that's like the learning journey. Like that's what you get to do. I think, I think as a founder, like I can't, I can't believe we get to do this. Like it is, it is so cool that we get, we get to go out and pick one corner of the world that we want to change. And we get to assemble a team around us to all go change it together. And like, yeah, there's gonna be failures. Like, yeah, it's gonna be hard, but like, it's like so freaking cool and so exciting. So maybe it's just a reframe around failure. Oh, I love that. Tell me a little bit about how GitHub sort of grew with you through this process. We love GitHub. When I told my team that I'm here today, they were like, oh my God, and here are our 10 feature requests. <laughs> we. We're in the business of delivering product that makes an impact. And where do we build product? It's all happening in GitHub. GitHub is at the core of what we do. And as we build our startup, GitHub is one of the things that helps us scale faster. For us as a startup, that's super meaningful. Like, what's our competitive advantage against the giants? It's we can be nimble, we can be quick. And so tools that allow us to do that, they mean a lot to us. One of those tools in the GitHub suite is Copilot. Our engineers say they can't go back to a world before Copilot. They think it makes them 20% faster, but that's sort of not even the whole thing. I think it makes them even faster without them realizing it because it's not the experience of typing the code. It's that Copilot helps them write more maintainable and readable code, which means that as we add engineers to the team, they're able to ramp up and contribute sooner. Danny, I love hearing about this journey that you've been on and you've learned so much, but if you were to pause and think about what you might say to the you you were before all of these experiences, what would you say to somebody who's just getting started or say to your former self, a lesson learned, something that you're really excited about, something to think about differently, what would you say? I have two pieces of advice that one I had on day one and one I wish I had. The one piece of advice I had is, my co-founder and I came from Cloudflare. One of the co-founders of Cloudflare, Michelle Zatlin, gave us this amazing advice, which is take lots of photos and screenshots in the very early days because you're never going to regret having those. And actually, it feels so silly in the beginning to take a screenshot of like your local dev environment on your computer with this sort of like janky prototype, but I'm so happy we have those and I, I think every founder needs to like pause for moments, take photos, take screenshots. The lesson that I've learned the hard way, the hardest lesson I've learned at Jam, is startups are always harder to build and take longer than you think to build. That's why we do them. We love the challenge. No founder likes an easy mode. But what does that mean? It means that the people around you matter 
so much more than you can ever expect because the journey is going to be long. The journey is going to be so tough. But with people around you who you trust and you love to build with, everything gets a lot easier. That's really inspiring. Thank you so much, Danny. Thank you. And thanks everybody for watching. We really appreciate your time with us. I hope you're as inspired as I am to go out and build something great. So thank you for watching and thank you again, Danny. It was really fantastic. Thanks.